Hello, everybody. Welcome back uh, to our ongoing Friday series of what is a library if the building is closed? Uh, a question that just kind of became self-evident uh, in uh, late, late last month, uh, if not earlier to uh, many of you, but when libraries really started closing in large numbers, uh, the buildings that is, but trying to remain open and provide services, it, it became a, an interesting way to kind of address what, what are we gonna do? And so we initiated a brainstorm session on March the 21st to talk about that in the context of three, three aspects of that question. Uh, internet access, uh, uh, digital services, and physical materials. Uh, let, me, uh, let me go back to screen share here real quick. Start from here. So uh, this this image is from uh, Schlow Center Library in State College, Pennsylvania. Uh, one of the projects that Gigabit Libraries has uh, is funded to extend and expand access to uh, library Wi-Fi and Word. And uh, this this image really captured a lot of what was happening. Uh, starting to happen last month. Now these signs are pretty common in, in different places and, and parking lot hotspots have become kind of the alternative to, to, uh, for people that don't have a connection at home. Uh, so we've had several uh, series since. We didn't record this, uh, the brainstorming session, but I guess now this is number five that we've done since that time. And this will be recorded and posted on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net, as you see there. Uh, the event is uh, co-hosted by uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, uh, the Internet Society, uh, and the Partnership for Public Access with our co-host, uh, Broadband Breakfast. Uh, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen is uh, running the control room from Brussels, I think Brussels, Stephen, wherever you are. Uh, say hello and introduce Ifla to people that may not know. Thank you, Don. So yes, uh, Stephen in Utrecht at the moment in the Netherlands. Um, um, yep, and with a nice view of the garden at the back. Um, so Ifla is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. We are the global organisation for libraries, working both to help libraries of all sorts around the world and improve the services that they're offering to help share ideas, develop good practices and standards, and also, of course, to advocate for libraries at global level and to support the advocacy capacity of libraries nationally and locally. Um, we're really happy that, grateful to, to, to Don for really initiating and being the sort of driving energy behind this series as it's such a great way of showing what can happen when you bring lots of library people together to share ideas and experience and it really shows what we can do. So um, I think you, you've already got the link to the resource page, one of the many bits of information, as Don has said, um, that we've put together. We're happy to sort of add some of the great ideas that you're coming up with there. And of course, it's always good for us to hear what are the challenges you're coming across. Is there anything that we can do that doesn't duplicate what's happening elsewhere to help. So thanks, Don, and back to you. Uh, thank you, Stephen, uh, not only for providing the, uh, the Zoom link and hosting that and also, uh, you know, helping manage the session itself, but for uh, the work and the support that IFLA has, has given uh, this effort and supporting, you know, libraries around the world, some 350,000 public libraries and you know, maybe a couple million total libraries represent to us uh, a wonderful network, a global network of, of professionals in a profession and, a, and an institution, an ancient institution that uh, people have come to rely on and trust like almost no other institution and, and sit at the heart of local communities 
in the U.S. anyway, libraries are almost entirely funded locally. And that gives them an enormous amount of freedom and flexibility to respond to the issues and needs of their own community. Uh, unlike almost any other institution, which have you know, very specific charters, like schools and clinics and, and so forth. They do, they do very certain things. But libraries really can do just about anything their communities want them to do. And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. And right now, it's especially valuable because we're all having to do things we never thought we would have to do. The fact that, that uh, we're having a, a, an international discussion hosted by an international uh, organization, we think matches the response, the, the global response to a global pandemic, a global crisis, if you will. And so, as Stephen said, you know, ideas and, and questions and come from can come from anywhere and be used anywhere. And, and so, to the extent that we can enable that in any part, you know, that's that's worth doing this. And it's also really interesting uh, uh, to uh, to hear different different stories from different places around the country and around the world. Uh, I don't think anyone from the Internet Society is on right now, but hopefully we'll get somebody back. Uh, Ramuna, are you happen to be on right now? Okay, well, uh, she'll be with us next week. Ramuna from uh, Eiffel, uh, a library uh, association that focuses on efforts in uh, mostly in Central Africa is going to uh, talk to us next week on the 17th of April about what's happening, what's happening there. And it seems that the, uh, that the internet is suffering uh, just from general dislocations, perhaps created by the virus. We'll find out more. Uh, and she and I full are a member of the Partnership for Public Access, also one of the co-hosts. Our media co-host is Broadband Breakfast. I don't know if Drew is on. Drew, are you on? Okay, well, uh, they have been very helpful in, in promoting uh, the, uh, the series. Uh, and uh, Drew is a longtime advocate of uh, broadband uh, build out and reaching everybody, uh, and, and has been a, a great help in this. So, uh, what is a library of building flows? These three elements that I mentioned earlier, internet access, digital services, and physical materials, uh, are kind of the taxonomy that we've used to, to address the question. The first one, and we'll, the first presentation today, we'll, uh, we'll get into uh, internet access, because without access, there are no digital services. And to a large extent, there's not much access to physical materials, though libraries, some libraries in places that are seeing less effect of the, of the, uh, of the virus are trying to continue to provide physical materials one way or another, curbside pickup, mail out, um, and so forth. And how those are being reserved either by phone or by internet is, is uh, one of the issues related to that. But our background as a GLN, deals more with uh, internet access and infrastructure. Uh, and that's where we think the, the, the most urgent action to be taken right now can be effective. And we're gonna hear an interesting story on that with our first presenter. Uh, the, uh, the big issue that at least we're facing in the US is what to do with seven million school children that don't have internet access at home. I mean, that's a, that's a, a subset of the wider question. Of what are we going to do when school is only online and how schools are, are dealing with that, how communities are dealing with, with uh, 50 plus million children who are at home uh, when they normally should be out at, in a school somewhere. This is probably the biggest single dislocation that we're, that we're feeling uh, as a society, uh, even though each of us are generally working from home these days, it's just a different, very different matter for all these kids who have pretty intense schedules of, of learning that they're trying to, to meet and match and that the schools are trying to provide. So 
we could replace our question here, what is a library if the building is closed? What is a school if the building is closed? A huge uh, question as well. And, and libraries and schools, how they can partner to address this is one of the things we're going to look at. But our, our principal statement here is assuring access to public information is an essential service. There's a lot of divisions about who's allowed to move around and who, who provides essential services. Certainly food is the, you know, at the top of the chain, our general utilities. Just below that, we would say that that this public service, this essential service, accessing public information is essential and and everything should be done to uh, assure that. Well, that happens to be what libraries do. Uh, it's their normal uh, job for libraries and, and it's what they do best. Uh, no one comes close uh, to performing that essential service. And, and so that's the drum that we're banging to let everybody know, especially uh, other parts of the government who are making decisions that affect us all. This is who we are. It's an open global collaboration of, of libraries doing innovative things with, with uh, technologies and uh, welcome to it. Uh, our speakers today, we're very lucky to have uh, Ryan McDowell from, from Network, uh, the the ES5 division, uh, a member of uh, Network Nebraska and education service for uh, schools in the area. It's a common condition in the U.S. for the schools to be extremely well wired, uh, mostly with gigabit fiber. It's, it's been happening at a, at a much higher speed over the last five years. It's just been unacceptable to a large number of us that our schools uh, have uh, terrible uh, broadband in an internet age. It just so that has that has worked pretty well under the mostly funded under the under the Universal Service Program in the U.S., which is the called E rate for uh, schools and libraries, and they're treated exactly the same under the program. But schools have been much more effective at at uh, uh, taking advantage of the of the program than libraries have. Uh, typically, school districts are larger, have administrative capabilities to to deal with a range of uh, applications. It's fairly complicated set to apply for these uh, these discounts under E-rate. Libraries, especially small town libraries, don't have that kind of capability. Uh, it generally also requires filtering, which a lot of libraries resist just on principle. Uh, and so libraries have disproportionately uh, not received as much uh, connectivity support as the schools have. Facilities ratio is roughly eight to one, eight school buildings to one library building. But the, the, the support under this program is uh, no. much, much less than eight, eight, one to eight for There library. we go. All right. Be a lot. Okay. Yeah, it, the screen froze up on me for a second. Okay, well, good to have you, whoever was having a screen freeze. So I am going to stop sharing now and, and turn it over to, uh, to uh, Ryan to uh, introduce himself a little more and uh, tell us about the project that he's done there. It's a really interesting project. I was gonna show some slides on this, but to save time, uh, it's a project that we were able to fund under a federal grant from uh, IMLS uh, to support the extension of uh, library Wi-Fi beyond the building, beyond the walls, as we say, out into the community to use long range wireless as backhaul to support regular access points or regular hotspots uh, in, in new places in town. What, what Ryan has done under this is uh, uh, find a way, a kind of an obvious way really, to use the fast internet connection to the school and then uh, a microwave link four miles away to the small town we're seeing here, Plymouth, Nebraska, to do a direct link, a point to point link to the library in the middle of this little town uh, that then uh, uses a, a, 
a spread mesh network to reach, uh, a reach around town to support individual students and then also uh, new library hotspots. One thing I'll say is that this is kind of typical. We talk about rural areas as being low density, and that's true when you measure kind of at the, at the county level or, or some regional scale, but typically the towns themselves are rather small, and most people live close to each other inside of the small towns, and then outside of the small town, of course, is where density really papers off. So it, it, it lends itself really well to these kind of mesh solutions. And with that, I will turn it over to Ryan. Thank you very much for uh, coming back. Ryan was with us. He gave a brief overview of this, but he's back today to give us more detail. So Ryan, take it away. All right. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, like Don said, my name is Ryan McDowell. I'm the IT director at uh, Educational Service Unit 5 in Beatrice, Nebraska. Um, we're a service unit that serves uh, about 10 school districts in Southeast Nebraska. Um, from anything from special education services to technology, which is my department. We also um, service 27 school districts throughout Nebraska um, with uh, E-rate help. So we stay pretty busy trying to file 470s for multiple school districts and recently started getting into libraries and helping them um, jump into the USAC world. Uh, so this project that we started is kind of an idea that we just thought, well, we have unused bandwidth from the schools. Um, this kind of all, all stemmed before the, the whole COVID-19 situation and, and all of that actually developed after, um, after we had thought about this. So we're, we're scrambling to try to get this up and, and live and, and working as soon as we can. Um, but we have a school district um, in our ESU, which is, uh, Tri-County Public Schools. Um, they have two main main towns, uh, Plymouth, Nebraska, and there's another town about four miles away as well, which is DeWitt, Nebraska. Uh, but there's a little over 400 people in Plymouth. Um, it's a direct line of sight. It's it's pretty flat area out there, so um, you can actually see see the town from the school. So we thought, what better way to to get internet to the school? It, but to bring up a, a microwave link from the school school rooftop to a grain bin actually in, in Plymouth. So um, actually yesterday we started installing one of the microwave links at the school. So we got, we got the, uh, we're using all ubiquity equipment, which is fairly cheap. Um, we're using air fiber equipment, which um, is actually gig, gig wireless um, capable. So, by the time it's all said and done, if the calculations are right, uh, we should have about 485 meg or so to Plymouth. Um, so if, if, if you can see the map that I'm sharing here, this is the town. I mean, it's, it's not very big, um, but the, the library sits pretty much dead center um, on North Jefferson Avenue there in, in, in town. So um, there's a, a large grain bin that, uh, will actually on the north side of town that will install the second link to um, to bring up this this link so if you can see the the aerial that i'm showing now this is the ubiquity air link calculator that we use to um to estimate this so you can see 486 megabits per second is is what we're hoping to get um line of sight if you look down at the bottom, there's there's the actual Air Fiber 5U radio that we're using, um, and these are these are roughly about $700 a piece, um, and uh, we we were fortunate enough to have a, a resident in in town that owned the this grain bin that said we can we can use their power, we can mount everything on there without any issues and free of charge. They're excited to to see um, increased access for, for the students and library in town there. So, so here's a little bit of what we're, we're planning to do. Um, we have, we're gonna install two 90 degree sectors on top of the, that grain bin. Um, it should cover the, the town pretty well. Um, we're gonna bring up two SSIDs on separate VLANs. So um, the traffic will be completely separated. So the schools, Students uh, there have Chromebooks that they take home 
through one to one with their Chromebook. So we're going to copy the SSID that is broadcast at the school. So when they go uh, home, if they're in town or in uh, within range of one of the homework hotspots, their their Chromebook will automatically connect. So they they won't have to configure anything. They won't have to worry about passwords. It'll all are automatically be configured and they'll connect. Um, that should make it make it simple for students to just have access. And then we're going to also bring up a separate uh, public library SSID so they can regulate that how they want. Um, it can be open to the public right now, or they if if you're a library member, um, we are thinking of different ways to to uh, allow access with a, a library card ID or or something similar. So. Um, these will be on separate VLANs, so all the, the student traffic will be secured um, and then the, the library traffic actually will be separated from that school traffic just for safe or security reasons. So here's a, a map of, of kind of an aerial of where the sectors will go. There's a the grain bin right there on the north side of town. Um, they'll overlap a, a bit. Uh, we should have plenty of coverage. Well, that the grain bin is about 110 feet high. So anywhere in town that we point another client radio back to towards that sector, it, it sh we should be able to bring up a um, an AP or multiple APs for connectivity. So we should be able to to broadcast that that signal pretty well across the city. Um, this is actual Tri County public schools. It sits, um, like I said, four miles away from Plymouth and four miles away from another small town about the same size, uh, about dead, dead center um, out in the country. So it's a, it's a rural school. Um, we brought, we actually put a, one of those air fiber radios yesterday on the bottom. If you see the, the bottom left corner, there's a, there's a shop up there. It's a flat roof. We just did a non-penetrating mount on top of the roof and pointed it towards um, Plymouth. And we're hoping we can bring up the, the second leg next week um, to get that connection established. And then we can actually start bringing up um, the client radios. But you can see that, I mean, the school, the school building's fairly large here out, out in the country, but there's, I mean, it's, it's got, it sits on, a, on top of a hill, but, but pretty flat. So it, I mean, from the top of the roof, you can see the entire town and the grain elevators and, and green bins. So. It makes uh, the point-to-point -point link pretty easy. Here's a, a picture of the radio that we actually brought up. Um, if you look off in the distance, you can see the grain elevator. Um, and then to the right there, it's hard to see in this picture, but there's an actual grain bin that we're going to be mounting all this onto. So um, that's, if you look, that's about four miles um, as the crow flies. Here's a, a picture actually of, of the grain bin that we'll be mounting things on. Um, so we were lucky to have this. I mean, if, if, if we didn't have this, you'd have to have some kind of tower or um, some kind of elevated structure if we were gonna use TV white space for this link. But um, since it was a pretty clear line of sight, we decided to use microwave for that high capacity bandwidth to get it to town. And then um, we plan to use some, uh, cheap ubiquity radios as well. I mean, they're they're roughly a hundred dollars a piece. So um, we could bring up microwave links in town, and then if we have issues bringing up uh, microwave links with with uh, line of sight, we'll use TV white space radios. This is an actual view from the top of that elevator, so you can see it's it's fairly flat. The school is kind of I mean dead center behind that pond there at back. And you can't see the school, but it's it, this is kind of the view up there that and gives you a general idea of, of how how level things actually are out there. So yeah. Um, so this uh, this should bring up. I mean, our our idea is to use. I mean, we'll have if we have roughly let's say 450 meg, we plan to split that in half. Students could have. 225, the library could have 225. Um, it should be pretty symmetrical. So they'll have 225 meg up, 225 meg down. Um, we've talked to multiple uh, places in town that are excited for this. There's an actual coffee shop. Um, and uh, I think there's a gymnastic studio. There's there's places that hopefully once, once all of this COVID stuff 
kind of blows over, we'll have, um, when people can congregate there again, there'll be uh, spots throughout all of the of the town that, that kids can get access. And there's a splash pad park there. We plan to bring up um, a couple APs in the park at the community center, um, the library all around the library. Uh, there, I mean, there, there should be plenty of places to gain access um, via parking lots in the meantime. And, and I mean, from your car or, or whatever, but we should have plenty of bandwidth. Um, and this, I mean, this is all, all fairly cheap equipment that anybody could do. I mean, if you have a school district that is close to one of your communities or a library, I mean, we can, you can, if you can bring up a point to point, if you can see the school or if you can't even see the school, if you can, you could use uh, TV white space equipment. Um, this, I mean, this is, this is all fairly basic. I mean, it, it seems complicated, but what, I mean, in the end it's, I mean, you have a few radios, and you're plugging in to the internet on one end and, and broadcasting on the other. So um, as long as you, you use VLANing and, and security, you can really separate things off from your network if, if you're worried about um, sharing your, your library internet or sharing your school internet, um, you can make it secure without, without issues. So I don't know if there's any other things that I, I haven't touched on, Don, that you would like me to, to talk about. Um, uh, that's great. Uh, you know, it's it's a detailed description of a, of a solution uh, that you know is is incredibly cost effective. Uh, the the point Ryan perhaps didn't hit was that there's no additional connectivity cost here. That is to say, there there are no uh, third party fees to connect uh, Plymouth. Nebraska. This is simply using the existing link to the school by by way of network network Nebraska, the ISP. But to connect this town of 400 and and these 46 students is just the cost of the equipment. And I think you put that at around 175 dollars per per student. Is that right, Ryan? Yeah, that's that's roughly what we we figured out. Um, with the cost of everything, if we if we split that out, out over, let's say, a lifespan of five years for the equipment, which hopefully it lasts longer than that, um, it'd be about $175 or $176 per student um, or $35 a student per year. So it's, it's fairly cheap. Um, another thing, too, that I mean, I brought up E-rate. Um, what our plan is, is, I mean, we, we put out a 470 for the installation for this point-to-point -point link. Um, but um, I'm not sure if we're actually going to use that since we're going to probably try to do most of this ourselves. But we, I mean, we're going to create create a. We have a letter um, or a mini consortium between the actual library and the school. So this this link here would actually become E-rate eligible uh, for the library. So then they could they can put out a 470 and and get bids and for maintenance and this becomes all category one. Um, eligible because this would actually be their dedicated link to the internet. So, I mean, in reality, you could have most of this funded by USAC and, and uh, this would be a, a cheap solution to your library. So, I mean, this is, I think this is a great way for, for others to be able to get some funding and use E-rate money that's, that's out there that they're not taking advantage of. Uh, it is indeed. And, and let me decode a little bit of that. Uh, uh, a lot of people conversant in this program will recognize all your all your terms. The Form 470 is the application under this federal program, this federal E-rate program uh, that has different uh, categories to fund basic connectivity to the facility, and then a category two for connectivity within the facility, mainly as in-house Wi-Fi. Um, uh, it's okay if, if this is a little, you know, not totally familiar, everybody's listening, there will be somebody in your circle somewhere that's very conversant in all this, and, it, and it's, a, it's a good point. And so playing it back, it'll, it'll be, I think it'd be much more clear if it's not already, and, and you made it very clear, Ryan. But I do want to reaffirm this point on eligibility. There are limits on how it's defined currently. And uh, in the case of the library, our our position is that these new remote library hotspots represent library kiosk, which is an, a type of an outlet that's eligible under E-rate. 
it requires that the state library have a definition uh, for a kiosk and recognize it. The, it is the sole responsibility of the state libraries to designate what is a library, a branch, an annex, uh, a bookmobile, uh -huh. and all of those uh, under that designation uh, become eligible. Uh, links between schools and libraries are, is obviously eligible. They're both uh, designated facilities. And then uh, the point about connecting students at home is kind of the, is, is an open point. It shouldn't be an open point. It means that where the student is at home now on this, on this device, probably a school uh, issued computer, that is school. Uh, and that is at least in the, in the current crisis situation that is absolutely should be considered an eligible link uh, because without that, there's no school. We can't have public school with some students not connected. Uh, and in some places, uh, they even have, have closed or shut down teachers who've been helping students offline because they can't help them all. And it's the dilemma, but it's you know something we really have to address. Maybe the most urgent thing is, uh, is how to connect all of these students. Uh, uh, the, the circumstance Ryan has just shown here, he's, he's has a, a number of fortunate uh, issues like the elevation uh, to create this line of sight. It may not be quite as simple everywhere. I'm, I'm sure it won't be as simple everywhere, but there is some kind of solution that can be found everywhere. The, the way to go at it is to go into each location, each geography, and analyze the existing spectrum environment. What kind of radios are able to be used in that particular area doing spectrum analysis uh, and then designing a system. But it's not terribly complicated. There are talent around everywhere, uh, either the local wireless ISP or uh, there's a group that presented last week. It's the old term now, what a, what a year last week was. Uh, but last week, Joe Hill is from ITDRC, org the information technology disaster resource center uh presented the work that they're doing and that they have a couple of thousand volunteers around around the country that are ready to go in and help help set up these systems these are relatively simple uh communication systems but they're really effective at, at bringing people back online uh ryan thank you very much uh i know people will be re revisiting these slides and and maybe even sending you uh uh, questions, though we haven't really exposed your email, uh, you can, well, just just write us. We'll forward you to uh, Ryan if if you have if you want to connect directly with Ryan and you can't look him up somewhere. Yeah, uh, and if, if if you look at the chat, I know uh, Tom Rolf is with the Office of the CIO for the state of Nebraska is actually is on today. Um, some people are asking about e-rate questions and and how do you cost allocate for signal that technically goes past the library? So I mean he's. He's kind of explaining how how you can do that. Um, I mean, you can cost allocate by usage or by device. I mean, if you're keeping track of, I guess you would have to keep track of who's connecting at other locations outside of the library, and then you could just cost allocate that um, outside of E-rate so you don't jeopardize your funding. Or I mean, yeah, if we can get the, the kiosk, um, use the kiosk method and, and bring up separate, I mean, kiosks for the library, that would, I mean, then technically you're, you're covered under e rate so it's a good point and and welcome and thank you tom uh the the worst case scenario is that you do have to allocate out a small portion of the uh, bandwidth that's being used for this perhaps not eligible uh service and in the context of uh, uh you know the wireless well here he's using 25 percent. so this is a substantially reduced amount uh, but that's that's worst case so uh, thanks again Ryan uh, now we are fortunate to have our our other speaker our time is moving along here but uh, we may run over a little bit and uh, uh, and and maybe not by that much but people are welcome to uh, to stay on we'll stay on and and uh, engage in any kind of discussion that people want uh, afterwards. Uh, but for now, I want to turn it over to uh, Stuart Hamilton, uh, our man in Dublin, 
Stuart is a longtime associate and uh, leader in the library world, uh, formerly the head of policy for IFLA, uh, did a stint as the deputy director in Qatar uh, as they opened a new national library there, and is uh, uh, recently back in the, in the rainy regions of the north, heading up development for local systems across the, uh, the libraries of Ireland. And uh, Stuart uh, uh, is going to introduce our, our speaker. Stuart, you're on, I hope. Yep, and I'll be very brief because, uh, because I want to hear from, from Christian as well. But uh, for those who don't know me, I'm in charge of implementing the public library strategy uh, for the libraries in Ireland. Uh, but Christian, who we're going to hear from, is going to tell us about the situation in Denmark, which is a country that I have a, a bit of an association with, having lived there for about five years. They've got some of the best public libraries in the world and some of the most innovative staff there. Um, when the situation happened uh, in, our, in, in Europe and we started closing libraries, I went online to see what other people were doing and Christian's blog, uh, which we'll throw into the chat, was one of the first places that I, I found good and interesting information. Christian is the Director of Libraries and Citizen Services in Roskilde, which is um, you know, 35, 40 minutes drive outside of Copenhagen. He'll tell us a little bit more about that. Um, but the libraries there were closed quickly and Christian's blog was very interesting to me to, to get up to speed on how other countries were dealing with the situation. So um, I encourage you to visit uh, Christian's blog, also the Library Planet website, which I'm gonna throw into the chat as well, which he co-founded and has a great focus on some of the best libraries around the world. Uh, and that's all I've got to say. I'm going to hand it over to you, Christian, and uh, you can tell us a bit about what's going on there. Thank you, Stuart. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Like that. Thank you for inviting me to this, uh, this great webinar. Um, no can you hear me all? Yes. Great. Um, thanks again for inviting me and thanks to Ryan for giving a excellent speech just before it was very interesting. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I'm calling in from uh, my allotment garden just outside Copenhagen right now. It's uh, Easter vacations, uh, 5 p.m. or actually 6 p.m. Uh, in the evening. Everything is really calm out here uh, and it's nice to be here with you all. Basically, what I will be talking about is uh, how we have gone about this whole situation in, uh, in Roskilde municipality. Uh, and I will raise, hopefully raise some questions, which I find very important uh, when it comes to closing physical library buildings and, and carrying on what, what we are supposed to do in, uh, in communities. Um, I think the important questions to me in all this has been to go back and just ask the question, what is libraries really about? And to me, libraries, uh, I often remind myself that they are not a goal in themselves. They are mean to, to something bigger. Uh, they are mean to, to create smarter communities, to create stronger communities, uh, to connect people, uh, to foster a strong uh, social infrastructure. And I totally agree with Don when he says that our job is to provide information uh, but I also think that our job is to create senses of belonging and, and connections and, uh, and, you know, feeling that people are part of a community. I think the library as a physical shared place is a, is a very important uh, part of that. And that is something that we have been, you know, thinking a lot about these days in Roskilde because all our libraries are closed. Just to give you the context of where we're at, Roskilde municipality has around 85,000 uh, citizens. So in Danish context, it's fairly big. In American context, I think it's pretty small. We have uh, six libraries. We have one library in the main city, Roskilde which has uh, 50,000 uh, people living there. And then we have five branch libraries around the smaller communities. Uh, we have citizen service too, three local archives and a mobile uh, bus driving around that is also parked at the moment. And um, I'd just like to take you back to March 11, where it all started uh, in, for, for, for us. Uh, at, a, at, a, at a meeting in the morning, uh, we decided to 
cancel all our program activities for for March. Uh, the the virus was being pretty aggressive also in Denmark, and things were you know a lot of things was up in the air, and we could see that a lot of vulnerable and elderly people were 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 put out there in and, and were being affected by this virus in a serious way. So nobody told us to do it, but just to be sure, we we cancelled our programs activities. Also, in the context that we have a lot of elderly people, we really love to come to our libraries. Uh, then in the evening, the Prime Minister, Minister Mette Frederiksen of Denmark called uh, to a press conference. You know, she basically closed down public uh, Denmark. Uh, she sent anybody, a uh, public employee home from work for 14 days if you were not in a critical function, like uh, healthcare or something like that. Uh, and every uh, public institution was closed down, uh, a complete lockdown. And, you know, it was just one of these evenings that, you know, um, I guess I will remember that forever. So I opened a, a bottle of red wine and I, I called my deputy and we talked about what to do. And um, and we decided to to not open the day after. We got some days to get, get things done, but, but we, we, we decided not to open just for the safe of, uh, of staff and community. So I come back to that, uh, but that was like, well, the, the story started. So to me, libraries, you know, and, and the way we should handle this, to me, libraries is, is very much about people. And going into your weekend, I will just recommend that you all go and put on the amazing song by the Smiths uh, called How Soon Is Now. And in the chorus, Morrissey sings, I am human and I need to be loved just like anybody else does. And, and to me, that really strikes what, what libraries uh, are about. We are also uh, about understanding collections. We are about media. We are about knowledge organization, information retrieval. But cutting to the bone, I think libraries are a people business, not a book business. Um, and you could say that people are complex creatures, but, but on a basic level, really, we are not. Uh, we, are, we are basically, you know, this is what we are thrive for in life. We, we, we thrive to belong and we thrive to love and to be loved. I would be very deeply about you if you told me that you don't need love and others to care for you in your life. Um, so, you know, a great 80s song might be a bit too easy to run with. So one could also turn to a psychologist, uh, Abraham uh, Maslow, his uh, hierarchy of needs, understanding uh, how libraries can work effectively uh, in communities uh, with Corona and without Corona. Uh, he, he suggests we have uh, five steps of needs in life. The first is physiological. We need uh, air, we need water, we need food, we need shelter, we need sleep, we need clothing, we need to reproduce uh, to, to, to survive as a as human being. Next, next one is, is safety needs. We need uh, personal security, we need some employment, we need uh, financial security. Um, we need to feel that our life is pretty safe. You know, those two basic things we really can see coming up in the air in times of Corona, where, where everything is, you know, putting out there. And then the third thing I think is extremely significant when it comes to uh, libraries and, uh, and how, how we get about in communities, especially public libraries. And that, that says that human beings need love and belonging. And that, to me, just put it to, to the mark uh, very much. And, and I'm... I'm Saying this because for us it has been really easy to provide ebooks, uh, online journals uh, to help our people from a distance via Zoom or Skype or email or phone or something like that. But but I, I come into our open libraries every morning when they are not closed, and I just see people sitting there with coffee, with newspapers, and I ask myself why don't they sit at the library? Why couldn't they sit at home at a cafe? And I just think that you know libraries are one of the the main drivers for forcing and fostering social infrastructure in communities. They are like open places, welcoming places, not judging places. They, we don't want anybody's money. It's, it's you know, in, in its essence, it's for everybody. And now we have lost that place. And, you know, and that is just really, really hard to get about, how to continue working with creating a sense of belonging, connecting people, um, providing social infrastructure when you don't have the buildings and you don't have the staff staffing those buildings. So I, I just come back to that in the end. Um, this is what we have been doing so far. First thing we did was think about the safety of our staff and our citizens. 
That is why we closed down uh, all our libraries uh, in, in the, the day after, uh, the night after uh, the Prime Minister press conference. Um, we uh, asked everybody who was not vital to be at home and just a few people came in and we get all the practical things sorted. Uh, we sent home uh, computers to people and you know a lot of uh, libraries around Denmark has been started to open up the collection and bring it out to people. And I think that is uh, really uh, sympathetic, but I also think it's very wrong because we are sent home for a reason, and that is to break the, the chain of, of, uh, of the rivals. And if everybody thinks, let's send people in again and work to do a little bit of work and a little bit of that, then, then we are gonna spread it more. So, so my staff is you know, it's at home. Uh, and that will continue to be there for the safety of the staff and for the citizens until we feel that it's you know safe to to go out into communities again. Then the other thing we were looking at was getting reorganized. You, you, you might not think that much about it because you've never been in a situation like this, but a lot of our organization is put up around us being able to meet physical together, you know, to staff a reference disk to have a meeting room where we walk into, to have like regular meetings where we meet and decide things and discuss things. Suddenly all of that was gone. So in our management group, we were really keen on how should we go about this when we are closed for, we don't know how long. So we, we set up a lot of things. We, we, we set up a different task force that was focusing on citizens and outreach and different kind of stuff. We met, uh, I've been meeting every mon morning for months now in the leadership group and every afternoon to check in on, on each other and also you know, to keep some kind of normality and infrastructure around the work. And it, it has been you know, working really great. We have been looking very much into how to communicate to our staff, uh, also to the public, but very much to our staff, how. I have 120 uh, employees. How do we reach them if they are all at home and not going out, not coming into work? Uh, we have also been, you know, saying to them, some of you are home uh, with kids. Uh, that is okay. Uh, don't feel the pressure about this. Uh, we have a job to do, but it's a situation out of the ordinary. Uh, somebody is at home and have a, a, a con condition about something, now worried about them getting COVID-19 or something like that. That is that is not easy to go about doing library work when you're actually worried about getting really, really sick. So we have also been really, really large about that. And, you know, just taking good care of your staff as you should always do, no matter the situation. Then we closed the library building. We closed down the physical uh, uh, collection. Uh, you can use it. Uh, we put all fines and all this kind of stuff on hold. That's closed all then. We started boosting our digital li library hugely. Uh, we, 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 we put a lot of extra money into the budget for, for, for digital collection. Uh, the, the, the use has gone up uh, with 100% for the first two weeks uh, on ebooks and 35% uh, on, uh, on, uh, on reading books. Uh, audio books. Um, we are doing a lot of segmented outreach. A lot of students are writing uh, papers these days. What can they do if they don't have the library to provide information resources to them? So we've done outreach to them, putting different different sites to get together so that they can so they can use uh, the, the digital library. We are reaching out to uh, families who have homeschooling. Uh, we have been reaching out a lot to elderly people or people who are not that uh, home on. Uh, digital platforms. We have been calling up uh, and reaching out to uh, people uh, in order to connect them with their family and friends, giving intros to FaceTime and Zoom and different kind of things. Uh, we have been doing virtual story times and rhyme times for uh, grown-ups and kids. Uh, we have a copyright issue in Denmark. We don't have a thing called fair use, so we have to make agreements with um, uh, the author and the publisher before we can read online. Uh, so we only, uh, that is, you know, that is administratively heavy to do in times like this. So we are only reading out of uh, public domain materials. Luckily, there's a lot of that. We're doing virtual recommendation. We are trying to put on a lot of user engagement. Uh, we have putting questions out on Facebook and different places on share what you're reading right now or, you know, destroy a, a, a book title with uh, Corona, you know, so people will post a picture of, of uh, Hemingway's uh, farewell to arms and they have, you know, marked out arms and it says a farewell to hugs and stuff like that. You know, things that can connect people online, mostly around literature. Um, yeah, we have been reaching out to, to citizens to, to help them. We have, I think it's really important, you know, regular people who 
are used to using internet and um, and, and and reading online articles, uh, going about information. That, that is not a big big issue these days. But for elderly people, people who are not that uh, not that digital scholar, it, it's a, and also isolated from their family and friends. That is a, a huge focus for us. Uh, the next thing we are going to do is to move our normal program activities uh, online. Uh, we have like uh, book talks and author talks. We will go in dialogue with uh, authors and say, would you do uh, the talk uh, online instead uh, and stuff like that. So we, we, we're trying really to, to say that the library is not closed. It's just working in different ways. That is important for us. Also, when we have been telling the stories to our politicals, to, uh, to the community and to ourselves, uh, so the last bullet here is that communication and storytelling is always important, but it is, you know, outrageous important in times as these that you have a straight story to tell and communicate, and you just we have used so much energy on communicating to internally and to to the citizens. So that has been really important. And the next step, uh, we, you know, it's up to this woman, our prime minister, Mette Frederiksen. Uh, she is our Corona commander in chief. She has been, you know, outstanding in willing taking leadership and taking action and just saying, this is how we're gonna do about it. We're gonna take it really seriously. That is why we are closing down. We know that nobody likes this, but but this is, you know, life is at stake. So this is uh, how we go about it. Um, she has, you know, announced a soft reopening coming next week. That means that uh, young classes in school will go back to school and teachers will come in. Uh, for libraries, uh, we are still closed until May 10th, and that goes for almost everybody, uh, other uh, institutions, uh, public institutions. Um, for us, uh, we might gonna look into activating the collection, the physical collection again, if we feel it's safe. Um, if the reopening goes as we all hope, then we will try to, you know, go into work, still have closed libraries, but go, physical library buildings, but go into work, take take books and, you know, just drive them out into hubs in the community, to elderly center and all these kind of things. Just get it out there. Uh, so that will that is something that we are talking about these days and preparing. Then, you know, as I started with in the beginning, our, our big, you know, big uh, obstacle these days is to create the sense of belonging and citizenships that a physical library shared place in communities can create. So that is, you know, the next thing we are going to be working on. We're going to set up virtual rooms for reading. People are reading together for each other and stuff like that. We are setting up rooms for learning, connecting, belonging, different kind of craftsmen, uh, online workshops, uh, shared singing and all this kind of stuff. Really trying to get into how can we create, it is impossible to create it, but how can we, you know, for isolated people, people who feel alone, how can we connect them with other citizens? How can we create virtual rooms where they feel that they are part of society and are just totally isolated uh, at home? Then I guess my last point is that to quote Ram Manuel, the former mayor of Chicago, never let a serious crisis go to waste. I just, you know, see so much learning coming these days. You know, the, the digital transformation is, you know, running so fast, so extremely fast. We are learning so much about how to pushing digital content and working digital towards uh, the citizens, but also, you know, internally in, uh, in in libraries and in our organization. So that is, you know, we have been setting up different evaluation steps in all these kind of things as good as we can, just to remind ourselves, it has been another week in Corona isolation. What have we learned? What can we what can we use on the other side, uh, and what can we use now? We're trying to document that and take that and use it again and again and again. I think it's really important to do. So, uh, Don, I think that was my final word. Now. Christian, thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, and you you bring us back to a really important point that you know people are going through. Uh, serious transformations right now. This this isolation has uh, immense psychological impact on individuals. Different individuals, like you say, are people that already work from home, maybe not so much. For people that are not conversant or even connected online, it must be really dramatic. Um, how how libraries can help people cope is is yet again, an example of what they've done, in the, certainly in the modern times, looking after uh, people's needs. People come into libraries with all kinds of issues, of problem, personal problems, 
that librarians help them with somehow try to find a way to help them. Um, where I live, uh, we step, when we open the windows, a step to the front door every night at eight o'clock and howl. <laughs> it's, uh, it's supposed to be a, uh, a way to affirm the work of the people. They're actually out there on the front lines, especially the, the healthcare workers, but really, you know, people that are handling our food, all the people that are essential for, you know, that, that lowest order on, on the Maslow hierarchy, you know, and, uh, and it's also a way to kind of let out some of this, uh, this pressure that people are feeling is it, kind of fun. Um, and, and, you know, we saw this in, in Italy where people would open their windows and sing to each other. It's just, you know, we're, we're reinventing civilization in a word, uh, or, you know, the virus is causing us to have to. So, uh, great stuff you're doing there. Uh, and in Denmark, it's, it's impressive how you, how you really look out for everybody from staff to, to your community and, and a great example. Thank you so much for coming in today. We'll, we'll be looking to hear, you know, updates from you as things happen. I mean, we're all in the state of change and things are happening. Um, got a question on, on, uh, uh, virtual spaces and rooms. Uh, we've seen more libraries licensing copies of Zoom, uh, like we heard from a prior prior presenter in State College, Pennsylvania. They licensed uh, ten copies of Zoom. They use three for the for the staff and in house, and they make seven licenses available for their for their patrons to conduct these kinds of uh, interactions. And so, um, you know, that's one. We're using Zoom now, uh, and there's of course been an explosion of news about the vulnerabilities of Zoom. Uh, at first, I thought that's what was happening. I got the strange message, you know, when we posted the wrong link. I thought, oh, we've been hacked, you know. Uh, but I don't think I don't think people are coming for us yet. Uh, you know, there's nothing uh, secret about what's going on here. We want people to see these, and so maybe we're not a target. We don't have valuable uh, commercial or or government information that uh, people may want to uh, mess with or control, but but we may, you know, it may happen. We may need to move on to another platform. I don't know what it is. I don't know what people are are using out there. There are a few. Yeah. Who? who? Stuart? Uh, hold on. Uh, hi, Don. I'm just wondering. Well, Christian could say a couple of words, maybe about sort of the. Um, uh, the virtual sort of platforms that he's using there. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, we are using uh, various platforms. Uh, we are using mainly, you know, for for meetings internally. Uh, we are using Zoom, and also for you know online virtual book clubs and and stuff like that. But just you know, it's not like super expensive, and I understand it's a business. I would be really happy if Zoom stood up and said. You guys, we are taking a stand because we have an amazing product. So we, we cut the prices, uh, or we give it for, for free until COVID is over. I think that will give them just a massive, uh, you know, kudos from around the world uh, because it, it is a, you know, it, it works. I, I never experienced any problems with, and and it, it it can be scaled to to many different things. So so we are using that a lot, but only have a few licenses uh, for now. We, we're gonna probably scale that up uh, after Easter. Uh, for community outreach, we use our web page a lot uh, to push information. We have a newsletter that is, you know, uh, getting extremely popular uh, these days. Um, and then we use uh, Facebook for a lot of engagement activities and Instagram too. I'm aware that uh, a lot of people, not a lot, but some people are not on Facebook. So we try not to, you know, just look at it. That that's the only thing. But the thing about Facebook is that there is a lot of people there and it's extremely easy to use as a library. So, um, so, so we have been using that, but, but you know, everybody should be able to you know, uh, have a newsletter and to access our website. So, so a lot of information, a lot of you know, segmented outreach pointing at different kind of information resources relevant to different target groups is, is kind of going through there. And then we, when we go to more, you know, engagements uh, and stuff like that, then we uh, we, 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 we use uh, Facebook normally. Um, our, our 
uh, our website is extremely, you know, it's okay, but it's static. Uh, it's, it's not up for you know, engagement and stuff like that. Um, we have uh, we have a really neat um, uh, arrangement in Denmark called the Library Watch Bibliotheks uh, in Danish. It's, it's a national uh, arrangement uh, with uh, almost every library in uh, in Denmark. It's a, it's a chat a reference uh, guide. It's opened, uh, you know, every day, also in the weekend and the evening. Staff, lib librarians across the country, so you can chat in and uh, and ask questions and get directions to different kind of resources. So so we, we are part of that and it's using it a lot. And it you know that chatting is kind of. I know I don't know if it's old school, but it's it's kind of you know the zeros or something like that. But it's it's really getting a rise in these kind of days because it's it phoning can be heavy, emails are static, but but chatting is kind of connecting with another person if you don't if you don't have an actual video call these days, you know. So chatting is 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 on the rise and and you know having a national consortium and arrangement about you know getting some serious librarianship outreach is really amazing. It's extremely that's uh, that's great. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, we, we have a we have a hand up from C Joyce as well. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Hi there. I was just wondering if um, Christian could mention that the first room he meant uh, mentioned Vinley. I didn't quite understand what you were saying. The first room. Uh, the plat we were we were asking about the platforms you were using, and you mentioned something before Zoom, something like Vinley, or I didn't quite understand what you were saying. Ah, oh, okay, sorry about that. What can I have been saying? Uh, I think I think my main point was that Zoom is a great platform, and um, we are also tried out Skype. Uh, that is like the municipality thing here in here, not Skype, but it, it doesn't work as great as Zoom. Um, then we're using Facebook, Instagram, our website, and our newsletter, uh, the chat service. Uh, and then there is a, there is a, an, a platform which is really Danish uh, called Googleberg. <laughs> it do, doesn't ring a bell to you, maybe, but it's actually it's it's it's, it's like a it's a, like a, a, a Zoomy platform for connected people with different kind of needs, which we are looking into using in these cases. It's, it's very locally based in, in, in communities around Denmark, but we are looking into, you know, using that as a platform for actually reaching out and connecting with, with people uh, that, that need help uh, uh, these days. Um, it can, working just sitting from home, it can be hard, you know, to pinpoint which kind of people in your community really needs the outreach. Uh, I heard about uh, an American library system, I think, which is a smaller system, which they just brought the numbers and the data in and they saw we have 17,000 citizens above 70 years of age. So they called them all up and said, hello, this library, can we help you with anything? Are you feeling lonely? Can we help you get online with something and stuff like that? And I just think to me that is just like wholehearted librarianship uh, in a nutshell that is really really great work um, so so I think for platforms uh, go about I think reach back and, and, and think about what is what is the what are, what are we trying to aim here is it you know is it to connect people is it to push resources out there uh, was it was it a stake and, and what which platform is, is, is the best for that uh, good uh, I'm gonna uh, pause right here uh, and uh, you know, bring bring this uh, session, the recording session, to a close uh, with an invitation for everybody to return uh, next week with questions and stories. We'll uh, try to generate more time for more open discussion. We'll continue to roll over past the uh, hour and do that. But uh, thank you all, Stephen. You can uh, pause our recording now.